Good morning, Mr. Fair. Good morning, my ladies and my lord. <clears throat> Before I begin, perhaps I can just check that we have the right bundles available to us. Um, there should be a, a core bundle, a supplemental bundle with three tabs, I'm hoping. Uh, an authorities bundle, and then I handed up just now two two documents. One is a, a, a an attempt to, to illustrate the numbers involved, three pages, and then the second is statement of practice five of two thousand one, which I sent to my own friend yesterday, and I'll refer to in due course. That concerns late claims, carry back losses. The Thank issue, you. as the court will have seen from the papers, relates to the question of what happens if a person makes um, a carryback loss claim and then the profits for the year to which the carryback relates are subsequently increased by the tribunal. That's the issue. <coughs> right. In my supplemental skeleton argument, which the court will have hopefully seen, I explain why that's relevant to this case. Because one of the points HMRC make in their skeletons, well, you've carried forward the loss, so what's the problem here? As I sort of explained there, the problem is that it's Part of the profit for 2009 is a profit that's now been recognized in 2007. And so by carrying back the loss instead of carrying it forward, HMRC will then have to correct the 2009 year and in doing so resolve that, um, that unfortunate case where they got the 2009 profit, which is higher than it should have been, but as, as it stands, nothing's been done to affect that. So the basic fairness issue is at the moment the same profit's being counted twice and we want to resolve that by carrying back the loss and then allowing HMRC to resolve that matter with their powers um, under paragraph 34 CUA. And I'll come to that in a little bit more detail later. But in any event, I mean, my learned friend makes that point in his skeleton, but it was common ground before the upper tribunal, I'm sure it'll be common ground in this court, that that coincidence of whether we manage to carry it forward cannot affect the correct interpretation of the legislation. There will no doubt be cases where a loss has been partially carried back only had partial effect when carried back because there were insufficient profits, and there's no carry forward, perhaps because the trades come to an end. So the same interpretation has to apply in both cases. And my little friend's interpretation says, well, even in that latter case, where you haven't been able to carry forward the loss, but your profits for the earlier year are increased, you still don't get the benefit of the additional loss. And there may be cases where you carry forward the loss and there are sufficient profits to absorb the loss, and you're in as good a position as you would have been had you carried it back. Yes, the, 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 whole, yeah. the whole range here. Yeah. So we say that point doesn't affect the interpretation. Yeah. In terms of the legislation then, it's, the, the starting point is section 393A, and that's in the authorities bundle tab 5, page 28, please. Page, I'm sorry, 28? 28 behind tab 5, my lady. Unfortunately, we don't have any tabs. Apologies. Uh, subject to section 492, subsection 3, which is concerned with oil extraction activities, so it doesn't concern us, where in any accounting period ending on or after the 1st of April 1991, a company carrying on a trade incurs a loss in the trade, then subject to subsection 3 below, the company may make a claim requiring that the loss, the whole loss, be set off for the purpose of corporation tax against profits of whatever description, A, of that accounting period, that's carry across, and B, if the company was then carrying on the trade and the claim so requires of preceding accounting periods falling wholly or partly within the period specified in subsection 2, which is the last 12 months. And, subject to that subsection and to any relief for an earlier loss, the profits of any of those accounting periods shall then be treated as reduced by the amount of the loss, or by so much of that amount as cannot be relieved under this subsection against profits of a later accounting period. So, we make two points there. The first is you can see it is a claim to, to require the loss to be set off against the earlier period of profit. That is the nature of the claim. Put differently, and this is common ground, it is not a claim to carry back part of the loss even if you can only make use of part of the loss. It's a claim to carry back the full loss. 
The second is to focus on what is said after the um, subparagraphs A and B, where it says, the profits of any of those accounting periods shall then be treated as reduced by the amount of the loss. So there's a very clear direction in the legislation that you should treat the profits of those earlier accounting periods as reduced by the amount of the loss. Whilst we're here, could we please look at page 30, which is subsection 10, which states, a claim under subsection 1 may only be made within the period of two years immediately following the accounting period in which the loss is incurred, or within such further period as the board may allow. And what you see there is a statutory discretion for HMRC to extend the time for making a claim and the statement of practice I handed up relates to HMRC's approach to extending the time for making such a claim. So they weren't obliged to let you make the claim at all, because you were at, at time in this case. No, we were, we were in time to make the claim. The claim was made um, with the 2008 return. But at the time we made the claim, oh, right. it was thought that the profit for the earlier period was insufficient to absorb all the loss. And that's how the issue arises. So our original profit for 2007 was 142,000. The profit was about 444,000. And so when we originally carried it back, we only used up about 140,000. But this says within the period of two years following the accounting period, oh, in which the loss is incurred. Yeah. So it's not the accounting period it's not year one, it's year two. Yeah. Yes, I see. Okay, thank you. So the claim here is in time. It's made in the tax return for the year it's ending 2008. In... Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And the tax year ended 2008, ends on the 30th of April 2008, and the claim was made sometime in May 2009. Yes, I believe that's right. After the 12-month period of an amendment, but within time, yes. Yes. A point which I'll come back to later, because I say it does have some force, is that given that the claim is simply to carry back the loss, there is only one claim of that nature you can make in relation to a particular loss. You say, I want to carry back that loss for that period of time. One claim. It follows that having made such a claim, you cannot then rely on paragraph, subparagraph 10 to make a further claim. Because you've already made the claim in relation to that loss. So whereas there would be a discretion to make a late claim in circumstances where there had been previously no claim in relation to a loss. There's no statutory discretion in relation to a situation where you've made the claim in time, but then further profits come to light. And we say you can use that as a tool to interpret or assist in interpreting the legislation because HMRC say if you make a claim and then subsequent profits come to light, you need to in some way mend that claim and you're out of time, you had 12 months, which ended a very long time ago. No statutory discretion to extend the time for amending a claim. But what we see here is a statutory discretion for making the claim in the first place to extend that time, which we say is rather odd that you can have a situation where you make no claim, but then there's a discretion to extend the time. And we'll see the circumstances in which that's exercised include situations where further profits come to light. But if you make the claim in time, there's nothing on HMRC's case that allows you to then come back to the point later when those further profits come to light, because you've, you've made the claim, you're out of time to amend it, that's it. That's HMRC's case as I understand it. Whereas on but my there are time limits for, for amending your return in, in the TMA, aren't there? There's a time limit. This would be Schedule 18 for amending the return. Yeah. TMA for amending the claim. Mm. There are time limits, 12 months from making the claim, 12 months from the filing date for the return, yeah. which ended a very long time ago. Yeah. And the point of this case is the profits are identified by the tribunal many years later. Yeah. In that situation, if we hadn't made a claim, 
the statutory discretion in paragraph ten, subsection 10 would apply, and HMRC would be required whether to extend the time limit. But because we made a claim, we can't make another claim for the same loss. That's already been done. And HMRC say, well, time limit for amendment gone. That's it, which is odd. And I'll come back to that later, because we say, well, that's an interpretive tool that may assist you in saying, well, actually, if you've made the claim, that's it. You, you don't need to make do anything else. You don't need to amend it. And that's why there's no discretion to amend a claim. So you say, because there's that uh, discretion in the circumstance where you've made no claim, um, it must be so uh, that there is an e there is equal wriggle room where you have made the claim. Either you don't need the wiggle room because it's automatic, which is my case, or that there yeah. you would expect Parliament to pervert it. And I say that is a, a tool that assists you. I don't say it necessarily decides the whole case. If there was clear wording against me, so be it. But given that I don't think there is clear wording against me, mm -mm. it assists the court. Right. So, uh, just to be sure I've understood what you're saying, you're saying it happens automatically? Yes. So, you think you've got profits of 100,000 in year one? Yes. And a loss of 500,000 in year two? Yes. You also have profits in year three of 500,000. What you think you're doing when you make a claim in year two to carry back the loss under subsection one? Is setting off a hundred thousand of that against year one, and four hundred thousand, therefore, can be carried forward against year three. That's what you think you're doing. Yes. Subsequently, it turns out that your year one profits were understated, and they were in truth five hundred thousand. You say that that it follows that you necessarily have to use the whole of the five hundred thousand in, in year one. You don't get any choice about it. It's not for you to. Do anything, right. amend anything, make any further claim. It just happens. Well, because no, no, I, I, yes, I just want to understand what, what your case. That might, you can say I'm, why, it, but have I understood that correctly? That's what you say happens. There is yes, but there is a nuance, which is the only way the profits for the earlier will be increased will be by HMRC doing something. They will amend your return, or they will issue an assessment. So it's only by HMRC doing something to year one that those further profits will then fall to be taken into account. Or in this or case, the FTT does. The FTT does. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And you can imagine a case in which you might not want that result. You, you might, I mean, maybe if, if the tax rates went up you, you, between year one and year three, you might prefer to have your loss carried forward to year three, as you thought was what was happening, rather than carried back to year one because it would be more beneficial overall. But but you say you don't have any choice in the matter. Uh, yes, uh, and that, that's the philosophy of loss carry back. And this is, as I understand it, common ground, that you can't elect to carry back part of the loss. Yes. You carry it back, it's carried back. And it's only such as cannot be used in accordance with the carry back provisions, which you've seen, that can then be carried forward. And so there may well be situations where you think, I'd like to carry back 100 and carry back 400. But actually, you have to carry back the whole amount. Indeed. So once you've made your election, you're stuck with the consequences. That, that's that's yeah. okay. Thank you and, very and much. And it says in the section the loss. Yes, uh, th that that point is common ground as well. Yeah. Uh, and otherwise, I mean, you you can you can imagine that someone might might if they've understated their profit in year one, then gain the benefit of the carry forward in circumstances where they shouldn't have been entitled to it. I mean, uh, that probably has to assume some sort of deliberate behaviour on the part of the taxpayer, some sort of arrangement, but. If you understay your profit for year one at 100 when you know it's 500, you then carry forward the 400, because in this hypothesis you've only used 100. HMRC come along, discover the error, increase it to, to 500. And on a HMRC's case, you get the benefit of the carry forward, even though you should never have had it. I mean, that probably has to assume some sort of deliberate behavior by a taxpayer, but it, on HMRC's case, that is apparently how it would work. That you're you get to keep the benefit of your carry forward if that was what you considered to be a benefit. Whereas we say the legislation is quite clear that you have to carry it back. You only carry forward the, that which you can't use. And then there are mechanisms for HMRC to adjust future years if you've carried forward too much, which is 
paragraph 34 2A, which I referred to in my supplemental. Will you be showing us at some stage the provision which enables you to carry forward the balance of a loss? Because as I understand it, in this case, you did carry forward 300,000 odd of the loss. Yes. And, and that was effective for, what, the 2009 year? Yes. We did carry it forward. It was effective. And as I said, our, my supplemental skeleton, to deal with HMRC's sort of prejudice point, HMRC have power without time limit to adjust that later year. Yes. What, what is the provision which enables you, if you can't, if you've made an election under 393A, yeah. which you have a choice, and so you've carried the loss back a year, what is the provision which says if it's not fully utilised in, in that process, you can carry forward the rest? I'm not sure we've got it before us. I think it's 397, I'd have to... I don't know. Is it 397? Well, don't, don't worry now, but at, at some stage... Sorry, yes, no, it's 393. It's on page 25. Where in any accounting period, a company carrying on a trade incurs a loss in the trade, the company may make a claim requiring that loss to be set off for the purpose of corporation tax against trading income from that trade in succeeding accounting periods. But, but that doesn't entirely help me, and I'd be, I, I'm sure perhaps you'll um, come back to it, but that suggests that that is what you're doing. It's the combination of carrying back and then carrying the remainder forwards. Um, it, I'm not sure that 393 enables you to combine the backwards and then the remainder forwards, or perhaps it does. Um, it, it's common ground and that's how it works. Um, okay. Yes, but I wasn't sure that 393 necessarily um, gives me the confidence that it works together with yes, and whether there is another provision, that's all. But don't worry about it now. No, my lady's looking for the provision that says you only carry forward so much as you haven't... Yes. Used yeah, yet. you haven't already used up. Yes. Um, <laughs> If I may come back to that, I yes, just got my head. I, I can't identify the provision. I'm sure it's there. There's no dispute. I don't think that that's how it is. It does work, but I, I know my lady wants to see it. And I'll no, no, that's fine. Thank you. Just to show you that this point remains a, a live issue in terms of the. Um, corporation tax legislation. On page 59, we have CTA 2010, section 37. And you can see the point in subsection 3. If the company makes a claim, the relief is given by deducting the loss from the company's total profits, the accounting period in which the loss is made, <coughs> and if the claim so requires, the previous accounting period. That's 37. Subsection 2 and 3, my lady. Yep. That's not the provision you're applying, but it just shows you this yeah. remains. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, section 397A says if you make a claim, these consequences follow. The procedural. 397. Sorry, 393A. 393A, yeah. Apologies, my lady. Thank you. The, the procedural um, mechanisms um, applying to such claims are in the Finance Act 1998, Schedule 18. And we've got paragraph 58 on page 53. <laughs> This is, has a title, 
claims or elections involving more than one accounting period. Paragraph, subparagraph 1, this paragraph applies to a claim or election for tax purposes if the event giving rise to it occurs in one accounting period and it affects more than one, one or more other accounting periods. Two, if a company makes a claim or election which relates to an accounting period for which the company has delivered a company tax return, an accounting period for which the company has delivered a tax return and could be given effect by amendment, the claim or election is treated as an amendment to the return. What, which is the difference between A and B? Sorry, I've been very slow. <laughs> it seems that it relates to and affects. Yeah. That's the difference of language. I wouldn't want to. It relates to seems to be the um, period in which it occurs, and affects is Broader. another period. If you look at subsection one, so in our case, this would be under B, wouldn't it? To be it affects the two thousand and seven accounting period for which the company has delivered a company tax return. I would venture that my lord is right. There are some specific provisions that say which year a claim relates to, and I would I would want to look yeah. at those before I, I said absolutely yes. But it's it's common ground now that this is not the paragraph subparagraph that applies to us. That's because it's too late to give effect by amendment to the return. Yeah. yeah. The subparagraph that does apply to us is subparagraph 3. That says Schedule 1A of PMA 1970 applies to a claim or election made by a company if or to the extent it is not A, made by being included by amendment or otherwise in the company's tax return for the accounting period to which it relates, or given effect by being included by amendment or otherwise in the company's tax return for the accounting period affected by it. So all that says is that Schedule 1A applies to the claim. No substantive modification of anything, it just says go see Schedule 1A. And 58 doesn't apply. Schedule 18 doesn't apply. That's the point my learner friend draws yeah. from paragraph 59, which I'm yeah. about to show you. Yeah. That's on page 56. Then subparagraph two, the provisions of this schedule do not apply where or to the extent the provisions of schedule one A apply. Yeah. So we're in one A yeah. territory. Yeah. But equally nothing has told us um, to not apply section three nine three A. That's one of my points is that ICTA still applies. And as I'll submit, must apply. So we then go to schedule one A, please, which is at the beginning of the bundle. It begins on page three. <clears throat> Paragraph one begins with some definitions, and we know that claim means claim or election. As respect to this schedule applies, and we've been told that this schedule applies. The subparagraph focus in this case of paragraph three and four. Paragraph three is the provision that tells you the time limit for making an amendment to a claim. And you can see in subparagraph B, at any time before the end of the period of 12 months beginning with the day on which the claim is made, the claimant may amend his claim by notice to an officer of the board. I contrast that with 393A subsection 10, which gives two years plus a discretion, no discretion. And then we come to paragraph four. Subject to 
certain subparagraphs, an officer of the board shall, as soon as practicable, after a claim other than a partnership claim is made, or such a claim is amended, give effect to the claim or amendment by discharge or repayment of pension. So I emphasize two points there, the as soon as practicable, and give effect by discharge or repayment of pension. And one of the important points I'm going to come on to make is that I say that discharge or repayment of tax must be the tax for year one. Look at subsection, sorry, subparagraph four on page eight. It says nothing in this paragraph applies in relation to a claim or an amendment to a claim if the claim is not one for discharge or repayment of tax. And you, you can perfectly well imagine that some claims and elections don't even indirectly lead to a discharge or payment, repayment of tax. For example, an election in relation to your um, calculating your residence on the basis of the pre-statutory residence rules or the post-statutory residence rules. That's just an example of an election which wouldn't fall within paragraph four, but nevertheless is within schedule one. But yours did, and you were, there was a repayment of tax, wasn't there? There was a 40 odd thousand pound repayment. We say yes. Yeah. But the upper tribunal saw, on our um, interpretation, saw some sort of inconsistency between reducing the profit for the early year and repaying tax for the early year. And we say there's no inconsistency. But if there was an inconsistency, then it's self-evident from 393A it's a claim to reduce the profit. And if that's not a claim to also re repay the tax, then it wouldn't fall within paragraph 4. But our opposition is it does apply because you can do both. And in fact, you need to do both. Uh, and here, here it was dealt with. The claim yes. to set to carry back those losses was acted on by HMRC within a, a short period of time, as soon as reasonably yes, practical. They repaid the tax by repaying yeah. the tax. And we assume that they, <laughs> whether if they thought about it, they probably would have thought they were doing it under this paragraph. So can I just be sure that I've understood what happens? You you put in your two thousand and seven return. Which shows taxes due. Yeah. You presumably pay that. Yeah. When's that payable by? Um, usually nine months after the year end, so before actually the tax is paid, usually. Right. Um, then you put in your 2008 return, which makes the claim under Section 393A. Yeah. Well, that is given effect to by HMRC repaying you the tax. Yes. Uh, um, it's in, my, in my example, my little table here. Well, no, don't worry about the example. I just want to know what the facts are of this case. Yeah. Uh, and I think it is common ground that, that the money actually went, went back. Yeah. And that was the same money as you had paid for the 2007. Yeah. 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 Which is the way you would expect it to work. Which is the way you would expect it to work. You couldn't expect HMRC to pay you back more tax than you've paid. I agree, which is why it says discharge or repayment of tax. So you, that's, in fact, this is one of my points, is you have to look at the early year, see what tax you've paid, and then discharge or repay based on what you've actually paid in the in the year one. Do, do we know what date the tax was paid and what date it was repaid? I'm afraid I don't, my lord. I'm sure with, with some digging we could look into that, but I, I don't know. But it would have happened, as, as my lady said, one would expect it to happen fairly quickly. Within within a, yes. a matter of months. Isn't it? Yes, HMRC received a return for year two. See that there's a loss carryback claim. Process it, and as soon as practicable, give effect to it by repaying the tax the early year. I can't tell you the dates off the top of my head. Is it like individual self-assessment? You get a sort of statement of account each year showing what tax is charged, what you've paid, what's still outstanding. <coughs> is, it, is it the same for corporation tax? Or? Um, There'll be something uh, online, won't there? That there's a, I'm sure there's an account, a running, running account, account that shows what you owe, yes. I can't 
Marcy. I've seen it, the account in this case, my boy. <laughs> but I'm sure there is something that allows both HMRC and the taxpayer to keep track of what you owe. And probably by reference to PAYE, VAT, corporation tax, property income tax, all sorts of taxes, and keep a running account so that everyone knows where they stand. <coughs> Thank you. I was next going to show you the other tribunal decision. It deals with the point quite briefly, essentially at paragraph 89. The court may well have read that and not need me to remind them what the, the tribunal said. And I'm very happy to take you there. We, we have read it, um, and you should assume that we've uh, read all the central documents, but perhaps you can quickly take us through it. Well done, Dora. <clears throat> just, just before we leave the... TMA, yep. there is provision in the schedule, schedule 1A for HMRC to inquire into the claims, that, uh, but that wasn't done in this case. You, you, yes, as correct. you say, you just process it as, as a sort of straightforward yes. thing. HMRC have a window to inquire into the claim in the same way they have a window to inquire into a, a return, return or an amendment or a return, and if they choose not to, then they process the return or the claim, and that's what happened here. And, and there are then time limits, and it becomes final, doesn't it? If they don't inquire, subject only to a discovery assessment. Subject to discovery assessment, yes. So they they didn't inquire into the loss claim. No, the claim is the, the claim is solid. It's a claim to carry back four hundred forty-four thousand odd. It wasn't inquired into. There's no dispute in this court that that was a proper claim for the full amount of the loss. The but question is the effect. Of that. Is there is there. At what point do you elect to only carry back some of it and to carry forward the you rest of it? You can't do that. You, you, that's, that's the very point. Is three no, sorry, but I thought you, you, you can only carry back to the extent that, it, that there are profits to absorb it. The claim is to carry back the full loss. Yes. Having carried it back, the effect may be limited by the amount of profit in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. But, having, but at having, some point you make an election to carry forward, don't you? <coughs> having, having decided, the taxpayer in their own mind, that we've had limited effect, yes. you then make a further claim to carry forward the balance. Yes, so c just help me about when you make that claim. Um, you would make that... Um, have to check whether you can make it at the time making the loss, but more li more likely at the time making the subsequent profit, you will show in your return that we've carried forward, or believe we've been able to carry forward this amount of loss and set it against this profit. Well, um, in this in this case, when you put in your two thousand and eight return, yeah, it, it ticks a box saying um, I want to repayment for two thousand and seven, and it says there are computations attached. And when you look at the computation attached, it says. Profit for 2007 was 140,000. I've yeah. got losses of 444,000, so I'm carrying back 140,000 of that, and I'm carrying forward the 300,000 odd balance. And then, presumably, as you say, you give effect to that when you put in your 2009 return, you set out your profits for the year, and then you say, but I'm carrying forward the balance of the loss. I my lord, I think that's correct, saying that I'm not sure you're committed to carry forward at that point you put in the 2008 return, because it may, it may be that you end up ceasing trading, and then you will want to look at terminal loss carry back instead. What I had in mind was the page attached to your tax return, yes. um, which is at page 7 of the... No. Is it my That's the one, yes. It does say losses carry forward, but you say that's not actually a claim to set it off against anything. It's just these are the losses which I think I've got available to yeah, carry forward. Because there's nothing else you can do with them. So, so having carried it back and considered that the effect is limited in some way, there's nothing else you can do with that loss, unless you cease trading, in which case you might have a terminal loss claim. Um, and so you carry it forward. That's just account is just being pragmatic and then that's what you're going to do with it. I'm not sure that's actually the claim. Um, I'd need to look into that if I was to, <laughs> to firmly decide whether that was the claim or not. Well, it can't be a claim. It can't, at this date, be a claim to set it off against the profits for 2009, say, because there might not be any profits in 2009. You might have made another exactly. loss. Um, exactly. but, but it is, a, it is you put in this document, your computation, 
you are thinking that of your 444,000 loss, you will only in fact be able to use 142,000, because that is what you think the profits for 2007 are. Yes. So you think you will have 302,000 to carry forward to use in whichever way you, you might be able to in the future. I agree, my lord. I agree. Yes. The upper tribunal decision, um, this issue is dealt with towards the end. It's on page 70 of the core bundle, paragraph 71 of the upper tribunal decision. Paragraph 77, the upper tribunal sets out section 393A. In 78, it states, the emphasis in the above quote is, our own, is our own, as the words highlighted are central to the argument. It is common ground that the claim to carry back the loss for 2008 was necessarily a claim to carry back the entirety of that loss, to the extent that there were profits in 2007 available for set off. Therefore, it is common ground that CES was not allowed to carry back part only of the 444,000 loss. In those circumstances, CES argues that the treatment in 393A is mandatory. The profits of 682 in the 2007 period must be reduced by the 444. 79, they say, well, if 393A was the only provision, that would be a powerful case. However, the statute provisions relating to carry back of losses were materially overhauled on the move to self assessment. And at the end of that paragraph, there is a degree of conflict between the ethos, that ethos of finality, and the idea that return for an early year could be disturbed by a carryback of a loss arising in a later year. Paragraph 80 sets out 58, paragraph 58 of Schedule 18, which I've shown you. Uh, 82, the upper tribunal reaches the conclusion that it's 58.3 which applies here, so we go to Schedule 1A, and then it refers to Paragraph 4 of Schedule 1A, which I've shown you. Uh, 83, it notes the limited period to amend a claim. And then at 84, it sets up the dispute as follows. The dispute between the parties and the carryback issue depends on whether the consequences of the successful claim are set out in 393A, Victor, or in Paragraph 4 of Schedule 1A. The taxpayer says it's 393A, which provides the entirety of the loss of the 2008 period to be carried back. HMRC say that Schedule 1A sets out a self-contained code applicable to CES's carryback claim and that our failure to amend its claim within the time limit set out is fatal to any claim back to carry back more than 442,000. So that's how the upper tribunal understood the dispute. It's got to be one or the other governing um, th this issue and HMRC say that Schedule 1A which applies is a self-contained code and you're out of time to amend. There's then a reference to Derry, but ultimately the, the key points are at paragraph 89, and perhaps the, the court wouldn't mind um, rereading that to see the reasoning of the upper tribunal. First and the second points in my submission are in essence saying that section 393A is not a comprehensive code and therefore you do need to go to schedule 1A to work out all the consequences. That, I, I don't actually disagree with that. My, my point is they're not mutually exclusive and you in fact apply both with full force.
third point seems to be a, a practical difficulty that, well, if the profits are subsequently increased in HMRC, you have to give further effect to the claim, then it's not clear what they do. Do they have to wait and see, or, or is there some other approach? Um, but as I said, I mean, you've seen the provision in, in paragraph four that says, as soon as practicable, I'll come back to that point later. But what do you say about that? Because here, on, on this case, HMRC would have had to wait 13 years. So HMRC don't have to do anything because necessarily. Well, in your case, there's in your case um, there's nothing to do until thirteen years later. But there may be other cases where HMRC a taxpayer could expect some repayment of tax. Is HMRC then entitled to say, "Well, I've got to wait because who knows? The profits may go up, profits may go down, my, my something might change." Two points to that. The first is, I don't see how it could arise, because the whole point is the taxpayer puts in their return and says my profit is a hundred. If everything is left there, HMRC repay tax on the hundred and carry forward the balance, and that's the end of it. If the only way that treatment is disturbed is if HMRC come along and say your profit wasn't a hundred, it was yeah. three hundred. Mm, yeah. And at that point, at the same time as a, as as addressing the three, the extra 200, all they have to do is also bring into account the loss and they'll net off. And so the overall result will be profit goes up by 200 but then reduced in accordance with 393A, no tax is either paid or repaid because no tax has been paid on that extra tax, that extra profit anyway because you didn't know you had it. And so there's, I can't think of a situation in which you'll have to have further repayment or payment of tax in it, in it, in the sort of situation we're looking at because it only arises where you're told you had profits you didn't know about and therefore haven't paid tax on. And that's what's happened here. In this case, though, tax was repaid, wasn't it? It's, it's the further repayment that my, yeah. my lady was talking oh. about. So, you, yes, yeah. of course, you get the initial repayment, but the proposition is, well, so HMRC deal with it once at that point. Mm. Um, isn't it a problem that sometime later they they might decide or might be told that you had additional profit for the yep. year. And my point is, that may happen, in fact, that's what's happened here, but no tax has been paid on that additional profit, so we're not going to have to repay any additional tax because you didn't pay the tax in the first place. But, but what might have happened is you might have set the losses off against a later year's profits, and so you've got to unwind all the other years, don't you? Well, you have to deal with that, but there's a specific provision that allows HMRC to deal with this consequential point without time limit. They're fully protected there. It's paragraph 34.2a, which I dealt with myself in Mentor Skeleton. And in fact, that was brought in with no grandfathering in 2010, presumably because Parliament realised that such problems might arise, where a conclusion in relation to one tax year by HMRC may have knock-on effects to other years that need to be dealt with. And so it brought in 34.2a to say, well, in that situation, HMRC, in relation to that issue, you can go and amend all the other later years to deal with that issue. But does that mean HMRC could say in relation to your claim to carry forward the losses in 2009, we're not going to pay you, we're not going to repay or discharge the tax due because we've got an, an open inquiry in relation to 2008 and who knows what might happen. And even if it takes 13 years, sorry trader, you have to wait the 13 years. If Each year is no longer a year in and of itself so that can become final because of the possibility of... But those, those, subsequent, those subsequent years are open to the extent that issues might arise in the early years in any event. That's the whole point of 34.2a. It keeps later years for which you've submitted returns open precisely because what's going on in the first year or the second year could well affect those later years. And that's the whole point of it. The whole point of it is to keep those, those open so that HMRC aren't prejudiced if they decide something in the early years that has a knock-on effect. And as my Lord gave the example earlier, you, you could have a situation where tax rates change and, and carry forward was favourable, but it shouldn't have happened. In that situation, HMRC will be able to sort that out by carrying the, you have to carry back the loss of the early year, and then you unwind to carry forward under 34.2a, and that's how it should work. 
What is the mechanism? I mean, if I've understood correctly, you, you, your submission is that what should have happened in this case is you pay your 40,000 for 2007, you put in your claim for carry back, you're repaid the 40,000, and as I understood it, you're, you're not saying that, that that shouldn't have happened because the, there was still an open inquiry into 2007. You still, still should have that. It was still reasonably practical for HMRC to repay you the 40,000 when it did. Mm -hmm. But once the open inquiry is finally resolved, which is not until the FTT is decided on the appeal in 2020, at that point, the amount carried back should have been increased from 140,000, which is what it was originally thought to be, to 447,000 to set against your profits of a year, which have now been restated at 680,000. How does that happen? How does the 140,000 get increased to, to 440,000? It's, it's not something that, that you do, because as you explained to us earlier, you don't have a, an opportunity to change your claim at all. So how does it happen? First point is to, rem to, to reiterate that the claim is for the whole loss. It's just the effect was limited in the first place. As the profit is in once the profit is increased, the effect is no longer limited. And so, at the same time as the tribunal increasing the profit because it's found additional um, profits, it must also take into full account the loss that was, has been properly claimed to be carried back. And so, it's sort of a, a balancing exercise. You increase by the five hundred forty. What's, what's the mechanism by which it does it? Because that sounds like an amendment to the return for 2007. The, the issue before the tribunal, the issue which the tribunal was deciding was what was our correct level of profit for 2007. Yes. But in order to take that, in order to decide that, you don't just look at the factors that would increase the profit, you also look at the factors that would decrease the profit. You come to the one, there's only one profit for 2007. There's only one correct profit under the Taxes Act of 2007. And that's the figure the tribunal was tasked with deciding in order to decide what the correct outcome of the appeal was. There's not two different profit levels depending on a Schedule 1A world or a non-Schedule 1A world. There's one correct profit level. The tribunal decided that our original 140,000 profits had been understated by 540, so you increased that. But equally, you apply at the same time 393A, which says you must reduce the profit. And so the correct profit for 2007, on, on the basis of the Taxes Act, is the combined effect of all the provisions that identify profits and all the provisions that reduce profits. There's only one correct figure. That treats your claim, made under 393A, as amending the return that you've put in, even though you're out of time to amend it. It treats as reducing the profit, my lord, and then the tribunal's task on appeal is to identify the correct profit for the year, which is what it does by taking into account the provisions that increase profits and the provisions that decrease profits. It's not that we've gone and amended the return, it's just that the tribunal now has to decide what the correct profit is for that 2007 year, and it must take into account, as I said, both the, the ups and the downs. It's no different to saying, well, if you submit a return showing 100,000 of profit and HMRC don't amend the return and say they raise an assessment because they've identified an extra 200,000 of profit, what is the profit for that year? It's 300,000. It's not two separate profits for that year, the return profit and the assessment profit. There's a single correct profit under the Taxes Act, which is the 300. And your simple point is that uh, um, because 393A says what it does, the whole of the loss has been in effect lodged <laughs> on the account yeah. as the counterbalance. Yeah. And when there's more uh, to um, set it against, then it just automatically happens. Yes, so that's why it's the tribunal or HMRC, whoever's making the, the adjustment to the year, they have to look at the overall position to get to the one single correct profit. And there's nothing more that you have to do because you've already elected to, to 
to carry it back. And, and there's no, and this is the point I was going to come on to, I'll, I'll deal with it now because it's relevant. There's nothing we could do. I mean, HMRC say, well, you need to amend your claim. But the claim is simply to carry back the loss. We've already done that. We didn't, ele- we didn't ask to carry back part of the loss. So what actually would we amend? And it's potentially relevant, if I may, to, 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 to show you the statement of practice now, just to illustrate what could have happened if no claim had been made. Because in that situation, no claim has been made, but we've seen under 393A, subsection 10, there's a statutory discretion for HMRC to accept claims outside the normal two-month billing. This statement of practice, which I've handed up, is the document where HMRC indicate how they will approach such late claims. You can see in paragraph 1, first bullet point, it knows the power under 393A subsection 10. It then sets out the normal rules. And if we go forward to paragraph 10, well, if we on, on the second page of the document, at the very bottom, the commission is for HMRC's approach to extending time limits for making claims. And perhaps I can just invite the court to read paragraphs 9 and 10 so you can um, see what HMRC say about them. This court is, of course, not being asked to apply this document. I'm merely illustrating what could happen in other cases where no claim was originally made, there were discussions with HMRC or further profits were later identified that meant you could have made a loss carryback claim. And this is how HMRC say they will approach the exercise of their discretion. And they say that situation where further profits are identified, possibly following discussions with the inspector, is a situation where they will consider exercising their discretion to let you make a late claim. Unless the results is brought about through oversight or negligence, in which case they won't. Well, exactly. I'm, I'm not asking you to apply this to this case. We haven't debated any issue with it, but um, I'm just illustrating that in cases where no claim was made, but, lo- but the tribunal subsequently identifies profits, it, putting to one side the possibility of negligence and omission of, of that sort, HMRC indicate, well, we will let you make a late claim to carry back the loss to the earlier period to the amount of the additional profits which seems very fair and reasonable. It's not, I'm asking you to apply to this case, but that's, that's what could happen. But what they're saying, is, by virtue of their position in this case, is, well, if you made a claim, but you thought you had only 100 pounds of profit, and therefore only utilize 100, but subsequently we, we identify 500,000 pounds of profit and add it on, and that happens outside the time for amending the claim, there's nothing you can do. There's no discretion. This practice doesn't apply. And that seems in my submission, striking and and unfair.
I now turn then to the core of my submission, which I had 10 propositions. They're not, I don't know, it won't take as long as perhaps that makes it sound. <laughs> um, and the first two, I think, are common ground. So I, I, I've already referred to some of them. So but if I may take you through them in turn, being very brief, I've already dealt with it. Then you can see the, the essence of my case and, and then have the, the submissions for the, the appellant. So my first proposition is that the statutory claim is to carry back the whole loss. And as I said, that's common ground. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two is that section 393A contains a clear statutory requirement to reduce the profit for the earlier period by the amount of the loss. And also, I don't believe that's disputed. Within, within that second proposition, I reiterate the point I've already made, that when section 393A refers to the profit, it means the correct profit. It doesn't mean the point you, whatever you put in your return, it means the correct profit. And therefore, when the first tier tribunal eventually decided that your correct profit for that year was 680 odd thousand, it's that profit that 393A is referring to that must be reduced. My third proposition is that nothing in Schedule 1A tells one not to reduce the profit for the earlier year. follows, and this is still within Proposition 3, that there's no inconsistency between 393A and Schedule 1A. One can both reduce the profit by the amount of the loss and repay the tax. It follows. And a, a point I've already referred to, and this is still within Proposition 3, is that if, the, if there was an inconsistency between reducing the profit, as we're told to do in 393A, and a claim for discharge or repayment within paragraph 4 of Schedule 1A, then paragraph 4, subparagraph 4, on its own terms, tells you that paragraph 4 does not apply in such a situation. I haven't quite understood that, I'm sorry. The, the, the point is that... <coughs> One of, the, one of the points, as I understood the other tribunal to make, is well, you can't have both a, a reduction in profit and a discharge or repayment of tax. And because Schedule 1A applies, it's the discharge of tax that takes priority with the exclusion of a reduction in the profit. The point I'm making now is that argument goes too far, because if it was right that there is an inconsistency between a claim to reduce the profits under 393A and a claim to repay or discharge tax, then the clear terms of paragraph 4, subparagraph 4, say that it doesn't apply. Because it's not a claim to discharge tax. If there is an inconsistency, then yes, it wouldn't, paragraph 4 wouldn't apply to the 393A claim. My case is there's no inconsistency. But what I'm saying is if, if it is suggested that there would be an inconsistency between reducing the profit and repaying the tax, then applying paragraph 4 by its own terms, subparagraph 4, it would not apply because it said we do not, this provision does not apply. And then what would you do? 
You would just reduce the profits. You you would reduce the profits and give them back to it. By what, by what means? You, well, having reduced the profit, then logically the tax um, is, is reduced as well. So it may be more inferential than explicit as it is in paragraph four. But if that if that were the case, then you would have to um, just reason it through as to what Parliament could have possibly intended. Um, but my case is quite clear that there's no inconsistency. And I'm going to come on, that's my next proposition. Thank you. <clears throat> So we're on number four. Proposition number four is that on the contrary, Schedule 1A necessarily assumes that one does reduce the profits for the earlier period. point here is that reducing the profit in accordance with 393A must be how one works out how much tax to discharge or repay. not an adequate end point to simply say that Schedule 1A, paragraph 4 says, give effect to the claim. That still begs the question, well, how much tax are we repaying here? And in order to work that out, what you have to do is work the claim through. How do you work the claim through? By reducing the profit for the early year, and then working out what effect that has on the amount of tax that should be paid or repaid for that year. And so my submission is that Schedule 1 necessarily assumes that we do go through this process of reducing the profit in order to work out how much tax needs to be repaid or discharged. So applying that to this case, we know when the claim was processed by HMRC, tax repaid was the 40 odd thousand which you had paid. Mm -hmm. That necessarily, on your argument, presupposes that in calculating that figure, the profits for 2007 have been reduced they've been reduced by 142,000. You've applied the full loss, but the effect based on the amount but of profit already shown is limited, yes. Yes. But I can well see that in order to get to a repayment of 41,000, it's necessarily implicit that you've reduced the profits by 142,000. Yes. What requires you to give effect to the repayment to require to reduce the profits by more than 142,000. The point I'm dealing with now is that there's no inconsistency or exclusion between 393A and Schedule 1A. So that so with the which means that the fact that we're within Schedule 1A doesn't mean that we don't apply 393A. Because what I understand to be said against me is that well because you're in Schedule 1A that's a self-contained code. You can essentially, you don't need to deal with 393A anymore. This is a self-contained code that deals with your claim. The point I'm making now is that's not right. We still need 393A. 393A still is very much live. And given that it's live in relation to working out the Schedule 1A um, sub, uh, paragraph 4 calculation, there is no reason why it all, wouldn't also be fully effective in relation to the situation we have here where the tribunal subsequently increases your profit. So it's not I'm saying that the, it's dealt with within Schedule 1A, it's that the Schedule 1A doesn't exclude 393A at the later point when the tribunal comes to look at this. So that's the answer to uh, my Lord's question. You're saying that 393A remains active? Fully active. Still within
So we're still in proposition four. We're in proposition four. I was, I was just waiting for my word to finish making a note. The, the second sub point is that not only is that necessary, is it necessary to engage with 393A in order to work out the tax that must be repaid or discharged, but the tax that is repaid or discharged is the tax from year one. It's not that there's a freestanding amount that is handed over to you. It's that what happens, what is required to happen, is you repay the tax for year one, or you discharge the tax for year one. And this, that leads to my fifth proposition, which, with respect, I submit that HMRC are wrong to say that this claim only disturbs the position for year one if it's treated as an amendment to the original return. And in support of that, I make the same two sub points I just made, which is it's the profits for that earlier year that are being reduced in order to work out how much tax to pay, or how much to repay or discharge. And further it is, as I've just said, Apologies for repeating myself. It is the tax for the early year that's being repaid or discharged. My sixth proposition is to draw a comparison with Schedule 1B. I'll show you in one moment. There we do have a mechanism in relation to a claim that could potentially affect more than one year, a particular loss carryback claim, where the legislation expressly states that the claim will relate only to the later year, and you basically go through a series of assumptions to calculate an amount that's then handed over, so you don't disturb the earlier year. The point I'm making is that no such approach is applied under Schedule 1A or anywhere else in relation to 393A. And the, if we could pick up the authorities bundle, just so I can make good that point, it's on page 15, please. You'll see it's Schedule 1B, the TMA 1970, claims for relief involving two or more years. I'm sorry, page? Page 15, my lady, please. 15, yeah? Yes, one five. <coughs> if, you, if you know when you make your, when you make your, claim in 2008 to carry back the loss to 2007, that the profit isn't enough to cover the full loss. Yes. And you know then that you want to make a, that you want to carry forward yeah. the loss. Does that count as a Schedule 1B situation because it affects two years? My lady, it's, it's common ground that this is a claim affecting more than one year, that's paragraph 58. Yeah. But this, it's also common ground that this schedule does not apply to corporation tax claims to carry back loss. It would apply to an income tax claim. Right. To carry back loss. Okay. So it's because, yeah. Okay. And we see under paragraph two of the schedule, loss relief, <clears throat> this paragraph applies where a person makes a claim requiring relief for a loss incurred or treated as incurred or a payment made in one year assessment to be given an early year assessment. 42.2 does not apply. In paragraph 3, the claim shall relate to the later year. And my Lord, if you, you remember earlier, you asked about the difference between rela relating and affecting. There are provisions that say when and when a claim does not relate to a year. And that's why I was a little bit cautious in answering which paragraph um, was the relevant one. 
or would have been, hypothetically. Um, subparagraph 4, subject to subparagraph 5, the claim shall be for an amount equal to the difference between the amount in which the person is chargeable to tax for the earlier year and the amount in which he would be so chargeable on the assumption that the effect could be and were given to the claim in relation to that year. Subparagraph six: Effect shall be given to the claim in relation to the later year, either by repayment or set off for, or by an increase in the aggregate amount given by 59b of this act or otherwise. So it affects the tax for the later year. So you can see this is an express statutory provision that says, "Don't touch the profits for the early year. Don't touch the tax for the early year. Instead, calculate an amount based on some assumptions, and use that amount." In working out how much tax to pay for year two or year three, what is the relevant year? The implication I say is that this is not the mechanism that you have under Schedule 1A and 393A read together. Is there a decision of the Supreme Court on Schedule 1B? I mean, Derry, yes. That, we've got that in the bundle. Um, that was concerned with um, an individual and whether 1B applied to a share loss carry back claim, and they held it didn't. We don't get much from the overall decision in that case. Um, I, I, my friend says we don't get much from the case at all, I think. Um, but at the end of paragraph 36, there is an observation that would be relevant in relation to this issue. That's on page 110 in the authority bundle. <coughs> paragraph 36. Having taken such care to walk the taxpayer through the process of giving effect to his entitlements as part of his tax liability for the year specified by him, it would seem extraordinary for that to be taken away without any direct reference or signpost by a provision in a relatively obscure schedule, that's Schedule 1B, of another statute concerned principally not with liability but with management of the tax. Section 1020 makes no specific reference to Schedule 1B and in any event refers only to information in general terms rather than anything likely to affect the substance of liability. By contrast, Section 62 and 128 sub 7 are more than mere signposts as the judges below characterise them. The words subject to are substantive in effect, imposing a qualification on the right otherwise conferred. Applying ordinary principles of interpretation, the absence of similar words in 132 would naturally be taken as indicating that this right is not subject to the same qualification. The point being made there is that Schedule 1B didn't apply to Mr. Derry's claim. I draw some, some support from that last sentence, noting that where Parliament's provided expressly for something in relation to a different matter, but not done so in relation to the matter you're considering, that is at least some support for the proposition Parliament didn't intend that to apply all the same results to the So you're saying that in relation to, to 1B, because yeah. you, you accept 1A does apply. Indeed, it did so, apply. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I say there's no inconsistency yeah. between 393 and A and B. W what I'm saying is that my learner friend submission, as I understand it, and obviously he'll explain it in due course, is that 1A is a self-contained code, and then once you get there, you stay within 1A, and you don't do anything outside of 1A. In particular, you don't reduce the profits for the earlier year. And I'm saying that's wrong, um, for the reasons I've already given, but also essentially amounts to the sort of code we have in Schedule 1B, of a self-contained code that doesn't affect the earlier year, doesn't affect the profits. But then that begs the question, well, why do we have this explicit mechanism for not touching the earlier year? Um, in, in Schedule 1B that doesn't apply to our claim. And the inference I invite the court to draw is some support that Parliament didn't mean that result to apply in relation to 393A, and therefore Parliament did intend the profits to actually be reduced. You didn't take us earlier to the provision that said HMRC can unwind the later years. Yes, that's 342A. I'm coming, that's one of my okay, uh, sorry. 9 or 10 submissions that I'm <laughs> Okay. And I'm 
up to seven, so it won't be long. <laughs> <laughs> the seventh prop is a knot I have, I have already made, but I'll make it again so you've got it in sequence, which is that even if a taxpayer was in time to amend the claim, following an increase in profit, there will be nothing to amend. And that's your, going back to your point that you, you claim the entire loss, you have to. And that's the only thing you can and, yeah. and need to claim, yeah. And that, as I've already pointed out, undermines my respectful submission, HMRC submission, that what we needed to do was amend the claim, but we're out of time, and the upper tribunal's conclusion to similar effect. My eighth proposition is also a proposition I, I've um, developed earlier, and I'll therefore deal with it briefly which is that on the upper tribunal on HMRC's approach, a taxpayer who makes no claim to carry back prior to amendment of the profit is in a better position. My, my lady's reading the words off. <laughs> That I've written, yes, is in a better position than a taxpayer who makes an in time claim. And as I've already said, my submission is Parliament could not have intended that. And the inference is that Parliament didn't think you needed to amend the claim. Ninth proposition deals with my brings us to my lady's um, request. It's page fifty of the authority bundle. Thank you. So the proposition I'm, I make: <laughs> there is a clear mechanism for HMRC to adjust later years if needs be. That's my proposition. given to a company by an officer, then it says it must state the officer's conclusion, make the amendments required, and then 2a, the officer may by further notice to the company make any amendments to the other company tax returns delivered by the company that require to give effect to the conclusion stated in the partial or final closure notices. This doesn't enable you to invoke any power. Your complaint on the merits, I know this doesn't affect the construction is that you ended up paying tax twice on the 255,000 because you put it in the 2009 profits and it's now been held that it should have been in the 2007 profits. Could you ask HMRC to take it out of the 2009 profits by exercising their powers under 342A? You could ask them, but <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's, a, it's a discretion as to whether to, to, to use this power or not. Our point is that they will have to use the power in order to get to the correct position if the loss carry back is given effect in the early year. And in doing so, they can't pick and choose when they go to the later year to say, we'll give effect to some part of it, not the other. So it's a way of uh, avoiding that need to deal with a discretion that we've not seen any indication is going to be there, um, would be forthcoming in any event. I haven't, can't say we've asked and been rejected, but. But this problem of the 
income being taxed twice mm. actually has nothing to do with the carry back in the sense that even if you hadn't carried it anything back I suppose you hadn't made a loss in 2008 you'd still have the same problem if you put the income into 2009 yeah. and it turns out it should have been in 2007 you've still got the yeah. problem that the income's been brought yeah. into account twice and one might have thought in those circumstances that there was a case to say that the revenue can't really have it both ways and if they succeeded in the FTT in saying it should be taxed in 2007 Logically, the only thing they should be doing is, is amending under 34.2a the 2009 returns to take it out. That, that would resolve that issue. Um, but, is but that is a, a... I mean, I can see how they're connected in this case, but yeah. in, in as a matter of the architecture, yeah. that's a happenstance in this mm. case. It, I mean, you could have been yeah. that, that your profits were increased for 2007, not because you brought them into account in a later year, but because you hadn't brought them into account anyway. Yes. That, that, that could, those could have been the facts, but they're not our facts. Instead, we, the loss was in 2009 and we carried forward the loss. It turns out we should have carried back, that the profit should have been 2007 and we should have carried back the loss. So it's sort of a, a sort of symmetry there, um, which arises, as my Lord says, on the particular facts of this case, um, whether HMRC would or would be prepared to, in a situation that my Lord described without the loss issue, Simply say, well, we've got the tax in 2007, we don't want it in 2009 to do something. And then that's for HMRC to consider with all their um, discretions and, and what have you. So I can see my Lord, I see my Lord's point that you could have a disconnect between the issues, mm -hmm. um, and they're somewhat incidental that they rise in combination in this case. But that is what's happened, and that's why we're before this court today, my Lord. Your point is that. If you've carried forward the three hundred thousand because you didn't think it was available to be carried back, yeah. that doesn't prejudice HMRC if you are right because they can always use this power to prevent it from being applied twice. Yes, and we've said that all the way from the first day tribunal up to this court that HMRC can sort out the carry forward issue under thirty four two A, and that's presumably one of the things it's there for brought in with no grandfathering and no time limit precisely to deal with sort these sorts of issues on the stream. It was brought in in 2010, did you That's, say? Yes. final proposition, my final submission, number 10, is that the practical difficulties the other tribunal thought existed with respect to not There's two sub-points, both of which I've already referred to, but I'll just highlight them so you've got them in the right place. The first is that the only source of additional profit for the earlier year would be by virtue of HMRC action or tribunal action. Well, could the, the taxpayer <coughs> could say we've made an error and we want to correct the error. There's, there are provisions, aren't there, for the taxpayer to correct an error. You can amend your return within 12 months, but thereafter you'd have to ask HMRC to issue an assessment. I mean, it's not a voluntary means of correcting your return after the amendment period. Yeah. You'd, be saying to HMRC, you'd write to HMRC and say, we've noticed... But within the amendment period, yes. you could amend it. Yes, but then equally within the amendment period, you can take full account of the additional yes. loss. So yes. Given that the only additional source of additional profit would be by putting my lady's example to one side, uh, 
HMRC taking action. The requirement is simply for HMRC to factor in the loss when taking whatever action it is. If they think they've discovered an extra 200,000 of profit, then they factor in the additional effect of the loss carryback claim at that point. And as I've already said, therefore, there will no, not be a further repayment of tax that you haven't paid the tax in the first place on whatever profit HMRC think they've identified. Sorry, can you say that again? Because the additional profit is only being brought into account as a result of HMRC action, you won't have already paid tax on that additional profit, and therefore, giving further effect to the claim will not require HMRC to repay tax. It's the it's the years that come afterwards that, that will require adjustment. Yes, you see in the power. And might there be a situation where the taxpayer doesn't want those years to be reopened? My lord gave the example of a situation where it was favourable for the company to have the losses Terminate. carried forward because of different yes. tax rates or whatever. But you say, do you, that where um, this additional profit is discovered and put into the earlier year, the taxpayer has no say about it and the revenue can unwind it all even against the taxpayers, even if the taxpayer doesn't want that. Yes, and that's the precise philosophy of loss carryback, is it's the full loss carryback. Otherwise, the taxpayer who makes the error and carries forward the balance is in a better position than the taxpayer who gets it right and realizes they've got nothing to carry forward. And if, if carry forward would have been more favorable, why should the taxpayer who makes the error and says, I've got 100 when actually I had 300, be able to carry forward? And the taxpayer who didn't make the error and says, I've got 300, nothing to carry forward, be in a better position. final sub point on Proposition 10 is, is to note again that the obligation is only to act as soon as practicable. And that, that may well, even in other cases, involve waiting and seeing. For example, if the return for the year one hasn't been delivered, by the time year two is delivered, which could arise, and taxpayers sometimes get things, um, the, mix things up, or just don't submit one year because it's too complicated, and submit year two. Let's say there's a loss in year two, year one hasn't been submitted yet, but a claim to carry back for loss is made in year two. HMRC will just have to wait and see what year one shows, and then they'll be able to inquire into it in the usual way, but there may well be an element of waiting and seeing, and there's nothing inherently wrong or um, contrary what Parliament could have intended <coughs> in that. Parliament's used the words as soon as practical, thereby giving you the, or HMRC, the flexibility to decide what is practical. I haven't referred to my table, even though I spent some time <laughs> putting it together. It doesn't do, doesn't take us any further than I've already taken you. It just seeks to illustrate three different scenarios and what and my understanding is the difference between the taxpayer's interpretation and HMRC's interpretation. So I've assumed in examples one and two, £100,000 profit originally in year one, £300,000 loss in year two, and a 30% tax rate. And then we get additional profits identified for year um, one of 200000 So we start off with our 100000 We pay tax on that at 30%. That's 30000 and therefore the tax paid for year one is originally 30,000. 
In year two, this is line four, we have our £300,000 loss and we make our claim to carry it back. Consequence is that our profit for year one goes down to zero, tax on zero is also zero, and therefore Schedule 1A requires HMRC to repay the 30000 Therefore, the end result is we've, we've, we've paid zero tax for year one. As I understand the upper tribunals and HMRC's approach, the key difference arises at line six. So having, um, because they say that Schedule 1A is a self-contained code that doesn't impact on the profit, they're forced to say that the profit stays at 100000 for year one, even after the loss carry back, because we don't repay the profit, but somehow we do get a repayment of tax, and therefore the tax is zero in either case. So that's where I think the difference of analysis arises on a, the original position. Then we look at the position following amendment. So the additional profit found by the first year tribunal is 200,000. And now we end up with £300,000 profit for year one. And the tax already paid for year one is zero because it was repaid earlier. The loss for year two has been assumed to be 300 and the loss to carry back is 300 The taxpayer's interpretation is that we carry back the full 300 reduce the profit by the full 300 and that takes us to zero, with tax on the profit at zero, and tax repayable or payable at zero, which is the right result. As I understand HMRC's or the upper tribunal's interpretation, at line six, because they say that the claim under Schedule 1A cannot affect the profit for year one, the profit must stay at 300,000 as found by, the upper, found by the tribunal. Well, tax on that would be 90,000 pounds, which then begs the question at line eight as to, well, what tax is payable or repayable and why? At this point, you paid no tax for year one because that was repaid. Tribunal has found £300,000 of profit. HMRC say that 393A does not come across and reduce the profit to any extent because Schedule 1A is a self contained code. So we leave the profit as it is. Tax on a profit of £300,000 would be £90,000. What then? I raise the rhetorical question do HMRC say the correct result is, and how do they get to that? table is a taxpayer who doesn't make a claim at all but yes. asks HMRC to exercise discretion. Okay. I don't need to take you through that. I'm very grateful for the court's attention unless there's anything I, that I can help with as the submissions for the appellant. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Uh, my ladies, my lord, uh, I'm going to set out first the revenues view of how the provisions in question apply to the facts of this case, um, and then to the extent I haven't done so already, I'm going to answer the points made by Lorenz Penn. Um, just before I get into that, I wondered if I might helpfully be able to clear up uh, a question my lady, Lady Justice Asprin asked about the interaction between sections 393 and 393A of ICTA. Um, section, uh, section 393 is at uh, page 125 yes. of the authorities bundle. The, the, the reason it's slightly confusing is because what we've got in the authorities bundle is 393 as it was originally enacted. Uh, 393A was obviously inserted uh, at a later point. Um, and when it was inserted, 3931 was amended to include a cross-reference to losses you've already carried back under 393. In other words, it, it, you can carry, carry forward anything you haven't already carried back under. When was 393A introduced? Um, I think it was 1990. 
mercy one. It says inserted by Finance Act 1991, but it yes. doesn't say what. Um, date. In relation to losses incurred in accounting periods after ending after the 31st of March 1991. I see. Yes. Okay. I'm not sure if that's apparent from the blunder. Well, no, yeah, it does say so in 393A1, but where in any accounting period ending on or after 1st of April. Thank you. So, um, my submission, the place to start in looking at the issue in this appeal is the FTT's jurisdiction. The FTT was hearing an appeal against a closure notice which amended the self-assessment in the appellant's 2007 company tax return. Uh, and ultimately, the question for this court is whether the FTT made an error of law in not taking into account the carryback claim uh, in deciding whether the company was over or undercharged for tax by that self-assessment as amended. The FTT's jurisdiction is set out in section 50 of the Taxes Management Act. That's page 21 of the authorities bundle. We can see there subsection 6 says if on an appeal notified to the tribunal, the tribunal decides that the propellant is overcharged by self-assessment, the, the assessment shall be reduced accordingly, but otherwise shall stand good. Uh, and then subsection 7 says the same thing in relation to the appellant being undercharged by self-assessment. Um, so what the FTT had to decide was whether the company was over or under or undercharged by the self-assessment, uh, and if so, to what extent. Now, the self-assessment in question was the self-assessment in the 2007 company tax return as amended by the closure notice. And the, the Is there a definition of self-assessment? Um, there is. It's in section 8, but I'm afraid that's not in the bundle. Actually, sorry, the corporation tax version probably is in the bundle. Yes, it's sorry. Um, page 37. This is paragraph 7 of Schedule 18. Uh, every company tax return for an accounting period must include an assessment, brackets, a quote, self assessment of the amount of tax which is payable by the company for that period. So the assessment of the amount of tax payable in the 2007 tax return was the 40 odd thousand? Yes. Although as amended by the closure notice, it was a higher figure. But the 40,000 did not take account of the carry back. No. Nor did the closure notice. No. And you say that was correct? We say that was correct. And I mean, this is the, really our point. Um, the effect of paragraphs 58 and 59 of Schedule 18 is that the carry back claim did not affect the return didn't disturb the 2007 return, and therefore didn't disturb, was incapable of disturbing the self-assessment in that return.
And therefore, there was no error of law committed by the FTT in deciding under Section 50 of the Tax Management Act um, not to take account of the carryback claim in deciding whether the appellant was over or under charge and to what extent. And th this goes to a, a point my Lord Lord Justice Nucci um, raised a couple of times. Uh, my Lord asked my learned friend, what's the mechanism? What's the mechanism by which the carry back is increased from 114,000 odd to 414,000 odd? And the, the mechanism has to be section 50, subsection, subsection 6 to 7. It, it, it's worth noting, um, my learned friend could have put his case is slightly different. He could have said, um, perhaps, that the original carryback claim, Schedule 1A claim, um, has some kind of continuing vitality, so that there should be some further discharge or repayment of tax from that. Um, it has something to say about that, obviously, and it doesn't, it doesn't assist him in this appeal, because this is not an appeal against uh, a closure notice on an inquiry into a Schedule 1A claim or a judicial review asking HMRC to give some further discharge or repayment of tax. Um, as, and also, I think the learned friend disavowed any reliance on that particular line of argument. But as, as far as this court is concerned today, th this is the mechanism. Now, I said that the effect of paragraphs 58 and 59 of Schedule 18 were that the carryback claim um, didn't touch the year one return. Um, paragraph 58 starts on page 53 of the authorities' bundle. There's a very there's a very clear and coherent structure to what paragraph 58 is doing as far as carryback claims are concerned. Um, what, it's, what it says effectively is that your carryback claim disturbs the year one return if you'd have been in time to disturb it anyway by means of an amendment. If you wouldn't have been in time to amend, then Schedule 1A applies. And then paragraph 59.2 uh, on page 56 of the authorities' bundle um, says the provisions of this schedule, i.e. Schedule 18, do not apply where or to the extent that the provisions of Schedule 1A apply. And the provisions of this schedule must mean all of the provisions of this schedule, including those about self-assessment and so on, company tax returns. So the, the, the logic of paragraphs 58 to 59 um, is that if the carryback claim is made after the time limit for amendment, it effectively gets taken out of the normal run of corporation tax self-assessment and put in a separate box dealt with under Schedule 1A. Um, just as a side point, the learned friend said it's common ground that Schedule 1B of the Taxes Management Act doesn't apply to corporation tax carryback claims. Right? That is common ground. Um, but the effect of paragraphs 58 and 59 uh, in the case where would have been out of time to amend um, is substantially the same as Schedule 1B. In other words, the carryback claim doesn't touch the return, doesn't touch the self-assessment for the earlier year. 
um, the, 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 the difference between individual and corporate carry back claims is that for individuals, the carry back never touches the year one return. Um, for corporates, it touches the year one return if you've been in time for the match. while we're here at the risk of stating the obvious, but for the sake of clarity, this does mean it makes a difference whether or not the carry back claim was made um, before or after the time limit for amending the year one return. Um, if, if, the two, if in this case the 2008 tax return had been filed a couple of months earlier, um, it would be a completely different case. That, that there's nothing surprising about that. That's just part of the logic of time limits. Can I be sure I understand how yeah. you say it would have worked had it yeah. been done in time? Mm. You would treat the 2007 return as amended yeah. to include a line saying profits for the year 140,000 less carry back, yeah. profits nil self-assessment no. And then when HMRC puts its closure, amends that book through the closure notice and increases it to 300,000 or whatever it was, HMRC would have to also amend the, the amount of carry back? Yes. So when the FTT on appeal increases it to 680,000, it would also have had to include yes. the whole 440,000? Yes. Well, that would have had the effect that Mr. First says happens in this case. But you accept that that is how it would have happened had it been done in time? We, we, we accept that, yes. So the only difference between you is the, fact, is the fact that this is out of time for making amendments and therefore out of time for disturbing that year one return. That, that's right. Otherwise, you agree with his approach to the if, legislation. If, if the 2008 return had been filed a couple of months earlier. I would agree that he's right. Yes. Um, now, the learned friend said there's no inconsistency between Section 393A of the Victor and Schedule 1A of the Taxes Management Act. And um, at, at that level of generality, I agree with him, but it doesn't take you very far in answering the, the issue in this case. Um, he still has to explain why it is that the FTT should have taken into account the loss claim, the loss carryback claim, notwithstanding that paragraphs 58 to 59 tell you that it didn't touch the 2007 self-assessment notwithstanding that it was the FTT's job to decide whether the, the company was over or undercharged by that 2007 self-assessment. I, I think Malone we'll Friend's answer to that is effectively to say, well, never mind the fact that the taxpayer could not have amended the year one return. When you're sitting there as the FTT, or possibly even as HMRC, um, you just apply Section 393A of ICTA and say, well, the earlier year profits will be treated as reduced. Isn't his answer that the loss claim was for the whole of the loss in the first place? Yes. So there was nothing to amend? Um, I, th I think the question about amending the Schedule 1A claim itself is, is something of a red herring. Um, the point is the the carryback claim didn't touch the return for year one. Um, therefore, when the FTT is looking at whether the appellant was over or undercharged by the self-assessment as amended, um, it shouldn't have taken account of the carryback claim. Um, that's what we say. And I think my learned friend says, well, no, the FTT uh, applies section 393A of ICTA, says what were the profits? Well, the profits are treated as reduced by the whole loss. 
Um, now, um, I, I, can I? Yeah. I'm sorry. You place a lot of emphasis on what the tribunal's jurisdiction is under Section 50, and I just want to be sure I've entirely understood this. The process in this case is the taxpayer puts in a self-assessment, and we've seen that. And that produces a figure of 140,000. And tax payable of 40,000, which they pay. There's an inquiry in time by HMRC, which ultimately, and I think 2012, leads to a closure notice and increases the amount that, that has the effect of amending the self assessment. Uh, that's right, yes. Subject to appeal. That's right. The taxpayer appeals to the FTT, as they have a right to. It's an appeal against the amount shown on the closure notice, is it? That's right. So when you say under section 50, subsection 6, on an appeal notified to the tribunal, the tribunal has to decide whether the appellant is overcharged or undercharged by a self-assessment. What it means there is the, the assessment as amended by the closure notice. That, that's right. And that means if you appeal against a closure notice, you can, as in this case, find that your tax goes up. Yes. That's just a risk of the, the appellate process. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. But it had already gone up by that much in the closure notice, and it's an appeal against that increase. It, well, it, it, went, up, it went up by more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I was saying that I think, think the learned friend says, well, never mind, the FTT, sitting there as the FTT, you can still say, well, I'm just applying section 393A1 Victor, the profits are treated as reduced. And I, I, I don't think I can kill that point by pure logic. Um, you, you could always say that. All I can really say is it appears to be entirely inconsistent with the statutory scheme in paragraphs 58 and 59 of the Schedule 18 of the Finance Act 1998. Um, it, it would also, in my submission, lead to some pretty strange results. And this is what I think the Upper Tribunal was saying at paragraph 89.4 of its decision about how you can't have a discharge or repayment of tax and a reduction of profit. What I think it meant is that on uh, the appellant's approach, you'd get double relief. Um, now I'm afraid I have produced um, a short written example of, of my own, which um, I'd like to hand up. these round numbers to make the maths more tractable. Um, we have a year one profit per the return of 100, a true year one profit of 300, uh, and a year two loss of 200. If we go through um, the steps chronologically, we can see what happens. Well, the first thing that happens is the company files its year one return self-assessing to corporation tax of 25% of 100 uh, and pays that. Um, then the company files the year two return, including a claim to carry effect loss, uh, and assume that, as in this case, it does so after the deadline for amending the year one return. Um, paragraphs 58 to 59 tell you it doesn't operate as an amendment of the year one return, but the company gets a repayment of 25 under Schedule 1A. Um, then, uh, I suppose that some years later, HMRC issue a closure notice saying that the true year one profits were 300 and there's an appeal to the FTT. Now, on my learned friend's approach, the FTT, in deciding whether the company was over or undercharged to tax, 
by that self-assessment as men did, um, we'd have to say, well, we just apply Section 393A1 to Victor. The year one profits are treated as reduced by the amount of the year two loss. The year two loss is 200, um, and therefore the year one profit is 100. And the result of that would be that the FTT would hold that the year one self-assessment would actually be unchanged from the original um, incorrect self-assessment, um, which is all fine except the fact that the company has already had a repayment of that £25. And so in substance, the company would get relief against the entire year one profits of 300 despite the year two loss being carried back only being 200. Now, this, this isn't, as I understand it, the result that the lender friend argues for. I think what he says is that at point four of this example, you just bring back the extra 100 loss rather than the whole 200. Because you've used up part of it already. You've used up 100, but. Uh, well, you surely you've got to use the whole thing. Well, it, because it, it's a, that's, it's, that, that's his argument. 393A talks about the whole loss. That, that's, that's my point. Uh, Alex, yes. that if, if, you've got to, if you've got to use the whole thing, you get double relief. Yeah. Um, and, and there's no way of unwinding it by reference to paragraph 34. Um, the, the way of unwinding it. Uh, would be an assessment under, I think it's paragraph 52 of Schedule 18 to recover, a, to recover the repayment of 25. Um, Is that time limited? It, it's time limited and also subject to the same conditions as apply to discovery assessments. I find this example a little bit confusing because it, it, it's pure coincidence that the original profit is 100, and the, and the true profit, once you've taken account of the loss, is also 100. Yes. Uh, I mean, you've set it up so that the figures don't change. Yes, but, I have. But your point is, it would be the same, even if you used the real figures, which is your well, year one profit's 140,000, thought to be 140,000. So you pay tax on 40,000. You then claim that back. You now discover the real year one profit of six hundred eighty thousand. What you're saying is that under if you if you apply the three nine three A, you have to take the whole four hundred forty thousand against the six hundred eighty thousand, reducing your total profits to two hundred forty, and you only pay tax on on that. But you've already had the benefit of the hundred forty thousand already. That, that's my submission. It's, it's, this so, is so the the fact you've set it up to be a, a coincidence doesn't matter it, to the, the point. It, it it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I chose the numbers because they're round. They're round numbers. Um, but you also chose the numbers so the assessment didn't change at all. But uh, that's your that's your point in four. Yes. Yeah, just. But only because that makes it slightly easier to see to see the point. But it's it's the same it's the same, same point. point. Yes. There's still there's still double counting. And you say there's nothing else except three nine three a, and so uh, it's Mr. First's point too that that deals with the whole loss. So when you come to look at it again, it's still the whole loss. There's no provision for saying it's the bit that we didn't use last time. It, it, exactly. Yeah. And obviously, I submit that the, the result of this example cannot be right. Then on the point about um, practical difficulties. Sorry, so you say that logic 
that though that strange result is the answer to why you don't use 393 um, and and your jurisdiction is the jurisdiction in section 50 is that well that that's right I, mean, I, I say that this this strange result appears to follow from Lemitan's approach and that's an indication that the approach is wrong Finally, for what it's worth, uh, on what the learned friend called the general fairness point, uh, it, it is, it's true that on the revenues case, the same sum, I think it's 255,000, gets taxed twice. Uh, as, as, as a matter of background, uh, what happened, the, the dispute, well, there were a number of disputes before the FTC, but this part of the dispute was about um, where there were certain sums that appear to have been paid to the company during its 2007 accounting period that didn't appear to have been accounted for um, in its uh, tax return for that period. And so the question was, where have these, where have these sums gone? Um, the answer as to 255,000 of that amount turned out to be that it had been accounted for in the 2009 account. Um, and not that it really matters, but the evidence before the FTC was that there was no particular reason for it having gone into the 2009 accounts, except that it was at the time they were preparing the 2009 accounts that the company's accountants realized that this 255,000 hadn't been accounted for anywhere. So they just stuck it in there. Um, so what you've got is uh, a situation where you've got 255,000 incorrectly, incorrectly accounted for in this year, and the same 255,000 now correctly being brought into account for an earlier year. And normally, the company would be able to um, make a claim to the effect that it had overpaid tax in the 2009 accounting period. I mean, it might actually have been an overpayment in a subsequent accounting period, because in 2009 it would have been covered by the, the carry forward, the extra 255,000. <laughs> it, it, it depends on what exactly the profits were in 2009 and subsequent years, which, which I don't know. Um, but the point is there's been an over there's been an overpayment in one or more subsequent years. Um, are there are time limits. And, and there are time limits, but that, that's the point. The company's just out of time. We claim that overpayment. So as my Lord, Lord Justice uh, Luigi observed, that, that doesn't really have anything to do with the carryback issue. It's, it's, it explains in practical terms why we're here. Um, but, but it's not itself to do with the carry back. So if they'd been in time, they could have claimed that they'd overpaid and they would have got that yeah. back yes. without looking at this question of carry back. Yes, yeah. especially when one bears in mind that at the time the 2009 uh, return was submitted, there was an open inquiry into the 2007 return the main subject matter of which is, where's this extra money gone to? Could you put in a contingent claim for overpayment? If, if the inquiry comes up with this result, then, then we want um, to, to claim an overpayment in the subsequent year. I, I would need to check that, but I think in, on the facts of this case it would be even simpler, because um, th there was no real that there was no, there wasn't a reason for it being in 2009. They knew they'd put it they, there because yeah. Yeah. they hadn't paid it. Yes. 
they could have just said, well, um, part of the answer to your question, revenue, is that actually this 255,000 we we put in 2009. So put it back into 2007, if you like, and then give us the, the 2009 tax. And so there's no question there about not being able to uh, discern or um, that that was the case at the time. No. Um, lady, unless there's anything further I can assist with. Thank you so much. Uh, no, Mr. Bradley, thank you for your submissions. Uh, Mr. Fur. Thank you very much. <clears throat> my my little friend's case depends entirely on this proposition that, um, very substantially on this proposition that we're the section 50, subsection 6 and 7, we're looking at the amendment, the self assessment. That somehow excludes consideration of the carryback claim. The problem with that is that whether or not the taxpayer is undercharged or overcharged depends on the correct profit figure for that year. only one correct profit figure for a year. By requiring the tribunal to come up with the correct profit figure, a single correct profit figure, you have to apply all the provisions that both bring amounts into tax, which is what HMRC rely on to say, well, these are amounts that should have been brought into account as profit, and amounts that reduce profit. But if you bring the whole of the loss into account for the 2007 year, what's the mechanism you say for recognising that part of it's already been brought into account? So this is my little friend's example. If we could pick up my example, please, because what my little friend says doesn't go through methodically and look at each stage. So on page two, well, if we look at the end of page one, in fact, please, by the, by the end of the original... Um, position, the tax paid for year one is zero. Why is it zero? Because the tax originally paid has been repaid. So we've paid no tax for year one now. That carries forward to the, the position following the FTT amendment. And the critical line my learner friend overlooks is line three. So you've got additional profit found by the FTT. You then amend it to 300,000 and the, you, you bring forward the tax already paid, which is now zero. And then you do your loss relief claim, and your taxable profit, in my example, is zero. My learner friend uses a slightly different example. So his loss is the equivalent of 200,000. So if we amend the line four to 200,000, and line five to 200,000. But what's the mechanism? I. I before we look at numbers, what's the mechanism? What, what's the statutory provision that enables the FTT to take account of the fact that only part of the loss is now being set against? That's what I'm showing you. The, the FTT takes account of the, the whole loss. loss. But because you've already had repayment of the tax for year one, when in my learned friend's example, at the end of the process, you end up with £100 of profit, the answer is how much tax have you paid on that? Zero. So you need to pay the tax on that. But, but what's the mechanism? What, what's the provision that en enables the FTT to make that adjustment? Because it, it, my learned friend refers you to, the, to section 50, subsection 6, which says the, the tribunal decides whether you're overcharged or undercharged. That's 
overcharge by reference to the whole gamut of taxing statutes, which give you the profit figure. That, I mean, that, that's the argument we were having in the first year tribunal here on a number of different levels. What was the correct profit figure for that year? There's only one correct profit figure. There's not two profit figures, one for the purpose <coughs> of the Schedule 1A claim and another outside of the Schedule 1A claim. Applying the taxing statutes together, there is one single correct profit figure. And so you, you, that, when deciding whether overcharge or undercharge, the tribunal brings into account that one single correct profit figure, which it decides upon by applying, as I said, the full gamut of those increasing, decreasing. And it, that's why you get at step two of my example, the three, full 300,000. So you, you, it's not that the tribunal is saying, here's a, here's a bill for an extra 200,000 of profit. The tribunal is saying, your correct profit figure for that year is 300,000, which takes into account both the profit you originally returned and the additional profit we've reached. <coughs> if you then change to align with my learned friend's example, the loss in year two to 200,000 pounds, that changes both lines four and five to 200,000. And at line six, the profit for year one consequent among carry back is 100,000 pounds, which is where my learned friend's example lands. And the tax on that in my example is at 30%, so 30,000. And the tax payable will also be 30,000 because of line three. You have not paid any tax for that year. You did originally, but you got it back. But now that we've found this correct position, total profit after full consideration of your claim, final profit figure is 100,000 pounds, you haven't paid any tax. You can't say, I'm relying on the tax I paid and you repaid to discharge that new bill. You haven't paid any tax. You got it back. And that's where the error is. It's at line five, or row five of my learner friend's example, where he says, well, because you paid tax and got it back, for some reason you don't have to pay tax on the 100,000, his example, 100 pounds the tribunal found. My, my response to that is, is, is at line three. No, you paid no tax for year one. Therefore, you must pay tax for year one on the profit, the true profit, found by the tribunal. He set up the example so that there was nothing to change. And the, the, the the overall assessment remains the same. Mm. So the FTT decides that, on his example, the amount originally shown, 25 pounds, is still the amount shown. Mm. And he says that 25 pounds has been paid because you haven't changed anything. You say it hasn't been paid because it was paid and then it's been repaid. And then exactly. So, uh, how did the revenue claim it? When does it become due? What's the what's the what's the provision under which it, it becomes a, a debt? Uh, the provision, because the end result of the FTT process is that you've got a profit now of a hundred thousand pounds that year, and nothing to set against it, nothing to discharge it, nothing to re to claim a repayment. Okay. And my little friend, I mean. I mean, that, that, well, I say <laughs> that must be right, but given that you've paid the tax for year one and now you've been found to have profit for year one that hasn't done what, on which tax hasn't been paid, then you, you have to pay the tax. I mean, we could take you to the specific provisions, but not, they're not here. But, but by virtue of the fact that the tribunal's found you've got profit of X amount, the, the assessment will follow at whatever the tax rate is on that profit. You haven't paid any tax. That's the key bit, from my respectful submission, my little friend misses, is that you haven't paid tax anymore. And that's fine in a world where HMRC don't amend the return, because then you 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 just follow 393A, reduce the profit, and you follow Schedule 1A and you've repaid the tax. Nothing's going to disturb that situation. That's that's fine. It's because HMRC come in and disturb the situation with their amendments then the tribunal is tasked with finding the one true correct profit figure for that year. And the consequences flow from that, both as to the loss relief, which is taken into account the amount you've already claimed, because you don't, you've don't you already had the benefit of the repayment, and therefore you don't get that repayment again, or you're treated as not paying any tax. So it, it all works through, and the strange result that my learner friend relies upon doesn't arise. My respectful submission, you'd have to work quite hard to arrive at his strange, 
strange result because you would have to ignore the fact that the tax has been repaid and treat that someone as having paid tax, even though they they haven't because it's been repaid. That's the strange result, but you have to work quite hard to get to that. striking the points my learned friend didn't deal with because they show in my submission that his the result he argues for is is unpalatable and unlikely to be intended by Parliament my learned friend was asked a question by my, my lady about well what about Mr. Firth's point that there's nothing to amend in the claim no answer the, the, my learned friend has no answer to the point that even if you were in time to amend your original claim there's nothing to amend because you've already claimed the full loss. So even if you're in time to do what it was the upper tribunal thought you would need to do to give effect to the, the further loss that you haven't used, there's nothing you can do. And conversely, there was no answer or response to my point that, well, a person who's made no claim is in a better position than a person who makes a claim for us believing their profits to be one thing and then later increased because then they can rely on 393A10. These are big problems because there has to be an overall workable scheme. It's, it's not enough in my respectful submission to come to this case, hone in on what he says the facts of this case, and not worry about what the facts of other cases might be to check that the scheme overall works in relation to claims to carry back under 1A. You have to check that what, what's being said here will work in a sensible way across the board because we assume Parliament intended a sensible scheme. My other friend doesn't have a sensible scheme to offer you. It's equally quite difficult to explain why the difference would be so fundamental based on whether you happen to make your loss carryback claim within the period for amending the earlier return or outside. I mean, the, 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 the time limit in section 393A is two years. But my learned friend says, well, the effect in relation to us finding higher profits later, HMRC finding higher profits later, is drastically different based on whether you happen to make that claim within the two years, but before or after the amendment time limit. I mean, fine, sometimes Parliament does draw lines in the sand, but did it intend one here? Did, do we have indications that Parliament thought there would be a drastic difference, whether it's before or after? And as I've just said, my learned friend can't even show you any mechanism in relation to a claim made after the time limit for amending the tax return for giving further effect to the claim. Oh, man, can't have intended that, and therefore that calls into question my whole, my learned friend's whole um, thesis about the way the scheme works. What do you say the effect of the provision in paragraph fifty-eight is? Because it clearly does draw a distinction between making a claim at a time when it can be given effect to by amendment of your return, and making a claim when it can't, in which case it's dealt with under Schedule 1A. Well, what, what's the purpose of that, and what are the consequences of that? The purpose of that is simply that if you're within time to amend the claim, it treats it as within the return, and therefore the inquiry mechanisms relating to amendments to returns apply. It's not particularly different to the Schedule 1A inquiry mechanisms, but nevertheless, the claim can then be inquired into as part of a composite inquiry into the return if HMRC disagree with the loss claim. If, HM, if, if you're under Schedule 1A, then there has to be a separate specific inquiry into the claim. It's procedural. And it may well be more convenient for HMRC to look into a claim 
as part of looking into a return as a whole, and therefore it's treated as being an amendment to return if you're in time to amend. But that's as far as it goes in my submission. It'd be quite astonishing if that happenstance, and it is happenstance, as to whether within the two-year time limit that Parliament's laid down for making this claim, there is this cliff edge as to whether you can have any potential um, safety in relation to further profits being brought into account. And that you just don't get that from the, from the legislation. There's nothing that tells you to switch off 393A when you're looking for the true profit figure for that year. Finally, just to the, the practical difficulties point, where I don't know if I made comments on how the error in 2009 arose in this case. Well, I mean, you, you've got the first tier decision, which I've referred to my supplemental skeleton. It was only discovered by the taxpayer, at least, during the, the course of the FTT proceedings. But more broadly, and I think my learned friend accepted this, he accepted in the upper tribunal, it doesn't affect the interpretation of these provisions. The interpretation in this case obviously has to apply irrespective of what the position is in relation to future years um, or the particular circumstance of the taxpayer. And you can imagine many examples of unfairness based on my learned friend's interpretation, whereas the simple, in my submission, um, the more obvious interpretation that avoids the multi So the court would have to be driven to the um, my learned friend's interpretation, but it needn't, needn't be in this case. Unless I can get further assistance, the court has positions in reply. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're very grateful to you both for your clear and helpful submissions. Um, uh, we will reserve our judgments. You'll be fully aware of the procedure in this court. Uh, judgments will be uh, sent out in the future in draft, and um, we ask you only uh, for typographical. Um, corrections, uh, not re-argument. Um, we just would like to remind you uh, in relation to the embargo and uh, therefore that draft should not go beyond the individuals who've already been named um, and the names have been provided to our clerks. Um, so take great care in relation to that. Um, and as you also appreciate uh, consequential matters uh, we hope that you will be able to agree and if you can't um, as usual uh, please make uh, written submissions short written submissions uh, and they will be dealt with um, by us on paper thank you very much indeed